Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to uh, be in your presence, whether you're in person or online. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us. Bless us with your presence, Lord. Lead us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading is from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Reading from CSB version, John ch chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That life shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and ex exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Praying me here before this morning. video issue. Uh, we had a camera number one just blanked out on us, and so we were at camera number two. So sorry the webcam is down a little bit, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, to look, uh, not look down on you guys, but to, you know, <laughs> look at you directly is what I'm trying to say. So, well, uh, we're going to do uh, a little bit different for an order of service. We're actually going to do the uh, songs at the, after the sermon because they really fit really well together. And so we're going to do those kind of at the end. And so a little bit of a change up. And so um, uh, I think we're all set and good to go now. So um, I am slowly learning how hard it is to learn English. And you're like, wait a second, you speak English, right? That's, you know, that's my native language. That's what I, I grew up. It's the only language I know, and I really don't know it well. But now that my son is in kindergarten, and he's learning to spell and that sort of thing, I'm just learning how complicated English can be. And then poor Seasung, I seem like, it seems like every week I text him something that just doesn't make sense because it's an English phrase that I grew up with, not something that makes sense in English. Even this morning, we were trying to determine who was picking up coffee to come set up, and I confused Seasung by my bad use of English because it was a phrase that I was familiar with, but one that wasn't familiar with him. And so, you know, learning English can be a challenge. If, if English wasn't your first language, language, you probably have figured that out. Now, my father uh, is a pastor. 
And so he um, uh, speaks every week. He does announcements at church and all that. And I remember as a kid, my dad had, uh, in the front of his Bible, he had taped a... um, uh, a list of like kind of interesting sayings. They, they, they're not quite dad jokes, but they can be kind of funny, but they're really made to make you think a little bit or to uh, you know, make you kind of think a little bit more. And, and some of them are a little bit comical. I'm going to try to back up to see if that takes that out a little bit. Um, and so uh, he had these taped in front of his Bible. And, and I remember as a kid reading through these, wondering what in the world are these? But they were English sayings that are kind of, Interesting. You're trying to figure out, okay, why does it say it this way? Now, since Father's Day is just 13 weeks away, I figured now is a good time to share these, and this will be my warm up to Father's Day in 13 weeks. And so, uh, I'm going to show, I'm going to share a few of his jokes, and I've added in a few of mine as well. Now, here's here's the classic one. Why do we park on driveways but drive on parkways? Okay, so so why does English do that to us, right? Why would English do that to us, all right? So there's something else. If you get corn oil from squeezing corn, how do we get baby oil? I'm just going to let that sit. I'm not, I'm not saying it, but how, how do we get that? Now, and if nothing, uh, uh, if, if you cook, you know that Teflon goes on frying pans, right? So if nothing ever sticks to Teflon, how do they get Teflon to stick to the frying pan? I'm just saying no one has figured that out yet, and... Why is abbreviated such a long word? I mean, come on, English, help us out a little bit. And, and this one's for Seasung. Seasung has been a, he, he's been a, um, a, he's a self-made financial guru who is learning the stock market. This was for Seasung, okay? He, he, he was on that whole GameStop thing. He, he made like $3 million on GameStop a couple weeks ago. Why is a person who handles your financial investments called a broker? Let, let's let that sink in. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Now, these are silly questions that, you know, maybe make you laugh, but they kind of make you stop and think a little bit more, right? They make you kind of stop and think, why is English this way? Why does it have to kind of mess things up or, you know, cause some confusion? But they also make you think a little deeper. I mean, why is it that we say what doctors do is their practice? Shouldn't they already know what they're doing? Okay, I'm I'm done. I'm done. All right, it's not Father's Day yet. I'll come out with my full arsenal of dad jokes on June 20th. Just be ready. I'm already writing them. I'm preparing them. There will be no sermon on Father's Day. It'll be nothing but dad jokes. All right. Now, for seven weeks now, we have been studying the core beliefs or doctrines of Christianity. And there's a lot of truly difficult questions that come with what we believe, things about our beliefs. You know, so many topics like the Trinity or creation, angels and demons, they, they've been quite challenging because like these, like these kind of funny statements, there isn't a clear, easy-to-explain answer. So the best we can do is explain what the Bible says about that topic and explain why we as Christians can and should believe these things in faith. So this sermon series, we call it We Believe, but we almost called it Indescribable. Maybe I almost call it indescribable. Because so many of the topics, we're looking at something that we're trying to describe in in a human mindset that just doesn't always make sense. Like the Trinity. Now wait till we get to heaven and hell. That's going to blow all of our minds because we're going to talk about some things about heaven and hell that really are kind of like, oh, I didn't realize that's what the Bible said about it. Things that we might not even have thought of. but So we almost call it indescribable because these things are kind of hard to describe. So today's we believe statement, today's doctrine or topic, is actually the shortest one we've had so far, but I believe it's the most profound and the most miraculous one that we've looked at yet. And it's the idea that God came to earth as a man. God came to earth as a man. It's kind of what we ce- uh, celebrate when we talk about Christmas. So here is our statement for today. Here is our we believe statement for today. We believe Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God. Now, this may seem kind of simple. Like, oh, of course I believe that, but why do you believe it? Why do we believe this? Because this is actually a very profound and deep statement. So what we're really looking at is called the doctrine of the incarnation. Right? And that's just a fancy word that means God put on human flesh. Carne is Latin for flesh. And so God 
takes on human flesh. That's what the word incarnation means. So let's look at a few of the key passages that help uh, show this from the Bible. The first one is from what Rahul read in John 1. I'm going to highlight just a few verses. John 1, starting in verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Uh, overcome it. So we, he, we see here that these verses show us that the Word is eternal, is God, is creator, is life, and is the light for our salvation. Okay, That's what John is saying. Whoever this Word is, they do a lot. And they're actually equated with God. But then John declares something that, I, that would have made both his Jewish and Greek audience raise more than just an eyebrow. He says something actually quite scandalous in verse 14. Something that would have shattered both an ancient Hebrew worldview and an ancient Greek worldview. He says this in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you would have been back in this time and you were raised in kind of a Greco-Roman mindset with ancient gods, you could not fathom that God became a man. It would have shattered everything you thought you believed in. Because here's what John is saying, is that no, no, no. God did become a man, not man became a God. And so he really would have shattered everything they would have thought. And he says in verse 18, No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side, because this is after Jesus had ascended, he has revealed or made known him, speaking of God. So it's not that man became God, but God became a man, and he even dwelt among us, not above us, as a Greek God was believed to have done. And if you continue reading in John 1, and you read the whole passage, you'll see he is talking about Jesus Christ. He's actually saying the word here is Jesus Christ. Then we get to the next passage that kind of takes us even deeper into the idea of the incarnation. That comes in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. This is Paul writing to the Philippian church, and he's actually talking about humility, is the context of what he's talking about. But he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. This is a very, very important passage for understanding the Incarnation. Because when we talk about God, Jesus is fully man and fully God, that's a struggle for us mentally to really understand. And here Paul kind of gives us a glimpse of that. He's starting to help us understand. When he said he emptied himself, it does not mean that he emptied himself of his deity. He didn't, he didn't give up his deity. He didn't give up his godness. But he emptied himself or laid aside the full rights and privileges of being God. Therefore, he humbled himself in order to be like us, identify with us, and eventually die for us. So if you study the theology that Paul is trying to share here, he's basically saying Jesus Christ had to become a man. God had to become a man in order to save us. So just a few things to clarify. When we say that Jesus was fully man, fully God, we're not saying that God added a human nature and lost his divine nature. He didn't, he didn't replace the two natures. He didn't stop being God while he was a man on earth. His divinity was united with humanity without either nature losing its essence. So you kind of think of it. If you think of like a, if you blend something together to make something new, like if you take milk and chocolate syrup, put them in a blender, you get something new, chocolate milk, Right? But this is not what really happened here. It didn't, uh, the, 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 the essence or nature of Jesus didn't become something new. It wasn't uh, God and then man, and let's mix them together in a blender and become something completely new called Jesus. That's not exactly what he's saying here. He's saying what we're, what we're learning here is that in some kind of indescribable, miraculous way, both this God nature that Jesus had and a human nature he had were united together in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And that actually changes everything about what we believe. So Jesus was 100% man. He was a human. And at the same time, 100% God. You're like, well, wait a second, how does that work? Like, I can't be 60% human and 40% grizzly bear. It'd be kind of fun. I don't know which I would do, the claws or the teeth, the fur maybe be a bit too much. There'd be a lot of vacuum in the house. I don't know. But we can't be part of something. And so we can't say Jesus was 50% God and 50% man because that's actually not what the Bible teaches. So I want to first look at uh, kind of how we believe that he is fully man and then look at how he was fully God and also why is it so important to our salvation and to the story of our salvation. So our first kind of big point today is we believe Jesus Christ is fully man. Right? We've already said that. So we're going to take that and explain that a little bit more. Here are just a couple of things that kind of help us understand from the Bible what we mean that he was fully human, just like us. The first thing is that Jesus had an ordinary human birth. All right. Now, yes, we believe that his earthly mother, Mary, was a virgin when she conceived Jesus. Scripture affirms that quite clearly, and we're going to look at that a little bit more in depth in just a minute. But the actual birth of Jesus was very normal like any other labor and birth. Okay? Mary had pain. I was with my wife through both deliveries. Ladies, if you've gone through that, wow, sorry, but I applaud you, okay? Um, but I was there. Mary went through a normal birth. There wasn't, it wasn't like Mary was pregnant and she ends up in this stable and there's like donkeys and cows looking gone. Also, you know, Jesus just appears and then her belly's flat. It's not how it works. She, he, he came through a normal birthing process. The second thing is that we see in the Bible that Jesus grew and developed as a normal human, human being. In Luke chapter 2, it actually, at the end of chapter 2, talks about Jesus as a child. And there's that interesting story of them traveling to the temple. He's 12 years old, and he stays behind to debate with the temple leaders at age 12. And his parents are like, where is he? And they come looking back. He's like, well, didn't you know I'd be here at my church just talking about my father? And it's like, okay, let's go home. And so here in this, Luke 2.40 says that he grew up and became strong. He physically grew. And then Luke 2.52 says he grew physically, intellectually, and socially as a young boy. A normal growing that we went through and are growing through in many ways. My wife would say I'm still growing up in a lot of ways. And then we're we'll also watching our kids. Rahul, you're still growing up? Yep. Rahul is just an 8-year-old trapped in a 28-year-old body. Yeah, 28. We'll go with that. We'll go with 28. So Jesus grew and developed. I actually know your age, but I'm not going to share it. I'm not going to share it. I will not say that you're the oldest person in this room, because you're not, right? See, son, guess. All right, so Jesus grew and developed as a normal human being, but then Jesus had a regular human body, all right? John 4, 6 says he became tired. Matthew 4, 2 says that he was hungry. Matthew 4, 11 says that he was at times physically weak. And Matthew, uh, uh, in all four Gospels, talk about how his body physically died. His heart stopped. So he had a very normal human body. Even on the cross, he said, I'm thirsty. So all things that we experience in our own human bodies. But he also had human emotions. Jesus had human emotions. Matthew 8.10 says he marveled at someone's faith. John 11.35 says he wept and mourned when his friend Lazarus passed away. Matthew 26.38 says that he was sorrowful. And John 12, 27 says his soul was troubled. Emotions that we have all experienced at some point in time. But here's the cool thing about all this. Because he was fully human, Jesus, God himself, understands us. He understands us. He's been there. He's done that. But there is one key difference that separates Jesus the man from us. And that is that he did not sin. That's the one key difference. If there's any to be named, is that he was without sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, 1 Peter 2, 22, 1 John 3, 5, and Hebrews 4, 15, uh, 4, 15 all state in some way that Jesus was without sin. They all make that statement very clear. So he took on the general nature of humanity, but he did not take on the sinful nature of humanity. Because if God could or did sin, he could no longer be God. Because he no longer was completely holy. And if he could no longer be God, then the cross and the resurrection and all that we believe as Christians falls apart. This is why it's so important to understand that, yes, he was human, 
but at the same time, he was also divine. So what was the purpose of God becoming a man? Why did he have to do that? Well, Hebrews chapter 2 helps us understand this a little bit more. Hebrews 2.14 says, Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, the flesh and blood, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring, humans. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters. He had to be like us in every way. Hungry, thirsty, tired, sorrowful, weeping. So that he he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God. To make atonement for the sins of the people. The cost or payment for a human who commits sin is their actual life. The the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages or the cost of sin is death. But the Bible speaks of sin in two ways. And this is important for us in understanding this passage. Because the Bible speaks of sin as like sins we commit, things that we do wrong, actions, words, thoughts. And that separates us from ourselves and from each other. Remember, sin brings separation. We studied that a few weeks ago. Sin brings separation. So when we commit sins, it brings separation between each other, right? But it also, because of our sinful nature, is the other way we look at sin it actually separates us from God. So no matter whether we're looking at committing a sin or having a sinful nature, we're separated. Separated from each other, and we're also separated from God. And the Bible speaks of two kinds of death, a physical and a spiritual. And so our physical death kind of relates to the cost of the sins we commit. All right, Our spiritual death, though, relates to the cost of our sinful nature. So they both have a payment that is required. They, they both bring separation. They, they both, uh, both must be handled. So when a person dies, it's kind of like they are paying the price for the wrong that they do. You know, you, you do the crime, you do the time. That's another English thing for you, see, so I can explain it to you later via WhatsApp message. Um, <laughs> there's some things that I say that often confuse people. All right. So when a person dies, it's like they're paying the price for the wrong that they do, but we needed something more to handle our sinful nature, that, that, that part that is embedded in, in our identity that really leads us to sin and really separates from God. So we needed someone who could handle the cost of our spiritual death because it is far more than we were able to pay. And we need someone who could handle the cost of our physical death because without having any hope of an afterlife, then we're left hopeless. We're left paying for our own sin and just dying and ceasing to exist if there is no hope. So what humanity needed was someone who could pay the price of all sins that have ever been committed by all people, plus the price of humanity's sinful nature. We needed someone who could do both, who could handle the physical and the spiritual. So we needed someone who could be fully man and fully God. There's only one person who could ever do that, whoever did that. And that person had to be perfect. They had to be sinless. And the only way a human could be perfect would mean that they would also have to be God. Enter Jesus Christ. This is why this doctrine is so important. Because if you start taking away his humanity from his divinity, then all of a sudden your salvation is on rocky ground. It's not secure. It doesn't have any kind of hope. It actually will not work if Jesus is not both fully God and fully man at the same time. So Jesus was able to make atonement for or pay the price for the totality of humanity's sin because he was simultaneous, simultaneously like us, being a human, and was at the same time God being perfectly sinless and holy. So therefore, he could step in our place and pay the price of our sin. That is what Hebrews 2 is talking about. But there's more. Look at verse 18 in in Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 18 says, For since he, himself, speaking of Jesus, has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Not only did Jesus help pay the price for our sins, but he's also helping us when we are tempted to sin, to not sin. So his ministry didn't stop at his death. He is still helping us now. He was tempted and did not sin, and he, he helps us not sin when we are tempted. So we believe Jesus, 
Christ was fully man. But they are also, at the same time, we believe that he was fully God. Now, a few weeks ago, we discovered in depth the doctrine of the Trinity, right? And we talked about how Jesus, we believe, is God. He's the, the, the second member of the Trinity. So we're not going to recap all of that uh, from, uh, from that sermon, but we actually uh, made the claim and defended why we believe the Bible uh, teaches and how it shows us Jesus was God. Okay, we've already really covered that. But today I want to look at some ways in that we see that he was fully God. Uh, I wanted to say how the fullness uh, Colossians 2 9 says, For the entire fullness of God's nature, nature dwells bodily in Christ. So let's look at that for a little bit, but looking at three things. Jesus had a divine conception through the Virgin Mary. Remember, we said there was a normal birth, but the conception was not normal. That is the big difference. Luke 1 26 through 35 kind of describes the encounter that Mary had with the angel Gabriel, who came and brought her some very interesting news. And we discussed that back in December during our Christmas series. But I want to read verses 26 through 35 because it's very important to help us understand how Jesus, this little baby being born or about to be born, how his miraculous conception leads us to understand how he was fully God. Verse 26 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. An angelic visit doesn't happen every day. All right? Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations uh, with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God." So Jesus' birth may have been quite normal, but his conception was not. There was no human father involved in this conception. It was Mary and the Holy Spirit. There's a whole other conversation we could have about that, but for the sake of today, and since there are kids in the room, we're not going to dive that deep, all right? So, but it does raise an interesting question for us that I think is quite relevant for us. Was Mary divine as well if she conceived and birthed the God-man, Jesus Christ? Because our Catholic friends would actually say that Mary is on a much higher status than we are. She is almost godlike. So I actually didn't know this. Um, You probably have heard of the concept of the Immaculate Conception in in Catholic theology. Um, I've never really studied Catholic theology that in depth. Uh, I know enough to have conversations with my Catholic friends here when, when it arises. But I actually did not realize that the Immaculate Conception in Catholic theology doesn't relate to Jesus' conception. It relates to Mary's. I didn't know this until I started studying it this week. So, the Immaculate Conception in in Catholic theology basically says that Mary's conception in her mother's womb was miraculous as well. And that because it was, she was born without sin. And she was born without a sinful nature. And so this actually was mentioned, I think it was 1864, by whoever the Pope was, made this decree and made this very much official. And I've, read, I've read the documents, I can send those to you if you're curious, but it's very easy to find. But according to Catholic teaching, she is not to be fully worshipped. They, they would say that she is to be venerated or honored more than any other person, but not as much as God. So kind of like, here we are, here's God, Mary's right here. Because she did something kind of cool, she had Jesus Christ. But it seems like many practicing Catholics that I know kind of practically worship Mary, whether they actually realize what they're doing or not. They they believe they're honoring or venerating her, but really it looks a lot like worship. And let me explain. The the, the issue comes down to with this the Catholic view of the Immaculate Conception is that Mary is now viewed as sinless. And if she is sinless, she's on an equal status with Jesus. If she is on an equal status with Jesus, then she could be prayed to. If you know the, the, the Hail Mary prayer, it's very, very common. It's, uh, I'm assuming it's the, the most common prayer uh, in the Catholic faith. Here is the, the, the Hail Mary prayer. 
It says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus Christ. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. That is the prayer that Catholics often pray to Mary. But if you notice there, the praying at the hour of death and praying for us sinners, there's this idea that Mary is to be the mediator between us and God to receive salvation, to, to, to receive God's forgiveness, and to have a lesser time in purgatory. And so whether or not they're trying to venerate or just honor her, really when you pray this prayer, in effect, you're worshiping her. And that's very, very dangerous. Because, as we see in the Bible very clearly, only God can and should be worshipped. Now, I don't have any ill feelings towards those who are Catholic, but I do have some very deep concerns with some of their beliefs, especially this one, that come from tradition and papal declarations and not simply from what the Bible says. Here's what I would believe that the Bible will clearly show. Mary was born a sinner and she sinned. Think about that. She had to be forgiven by her son. Now, if you read the story of, of, of Jesus, who is it that doubted he was who he says he was at the beginning? His mothers and brothers and sisters. They came after him when he was he, he, near their hometown. And they said, okay, Jesus, you're, you're, you're bringing some shame to the family because everyone thinks you're crazy. And Jesus said, wait a second, who, am I, who are actually my mothers and brothers and sisters? They are my followers, those who are around here listening. Now, by the end of Jesus' ministry, all of his family comes around. All right. Uh, two of his half-brothers go on to lead uh, churches and to write uh, books of the Bible. And even Mary at the cross, she was there. She didn't desert her son. But she was a sinner. She sinned. She needed the forgiveness that Jesus, her own son, brought. She gave birth to the one who created her and to the one she would need for her own salvation. So Mary was not sinless. She should not be worshipped or prayed to and was not divine in any way. She was simply a special woman chosen for an amazing role. So I wanted to share that because I've had many conversations with friends and neighbors who are really trying to understand what is the difference between me as a Catholic and when they look at me as a, as a non-Catholic, as a Protestant. And often I have to explain some of the differences because there are a lot of things that we believe that are similar. But there are some things like this that, I believe, that we believe that are quite different. So let's get back to explaining why I believe Jesus was fully God. We believe his conception was miraculous and proves his divinity. But we also see that Jesus himself claimed to be fully God. He made these claims. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him right after he said this. Jesus replied, I've, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? We aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. When Jesus was um, forgiving sins and he was making these claims, the people around him knew what he was actually saying. They knew he was equating himself with God. So Jesus claimed that he was fully God, and ultimately he was killed for believing this about himself. Next thing we see is that Jesus used titles that only someone who is fully God could use. Two titles in particular I want us to mention today. When picking a title for himself, Jesus was quite fond of using the title Son of Man. You may have heard this. He used it almost 80 times when he was conversing with people. He would say, I am the Son of Man. Now, it kind of relates to his humanity. But he's actually taking this from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 says, this is Daniel who kind of has this unique prophetic vision. He's trying to understand it. Uh, Gabriel actually comes and for three chapters helps him understand it. Some really cool things about angels fighting angels. We talked about that last week. Daniel says, I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He, this, this son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those Every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. For the Jewish people in Jesus' day, the title Son of Man was equated with Messiah. So the Messiah, if you grew up in the, in the Jewish faith at this point in history, the Messiah was the promised one who was supposed to come redeem 
Israel from oppression, defeat all their enemies, and completely liberate them both physically and spiritually and even politically. That was the role of the Messiah. So they were waiting for him. The prophets talked about this Messiah coming. All these different problems, where he would be born, what he would do, all these different things. So when Jesus steps on the scene and says 80 times, I'm the son of man, he's very clearly stating, I am that promised Messiah. And if you read in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 52 and 53, we see that the Messiah is the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And then in chapter two, uh, 52 and 53 of Isaiah, the, this Messiah is also going to be the suffering servant who's going to lay down his life so everyone else could live. That was going to be the role of the Messiah. And Jesus appears on the scene and says, guess what? That's me. I'm him. So that's why he used so often the title Son of Man. But the other title he used was Son of God, relating to his divinity. Claiming this title was also equating yourself with being God. John 5, 18. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him, Jesus. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal to God. So when he says, I am the Son of God, he is saying, I am God. If he was the Son of God, then he would be fully God and could do all that God could do, like heal the sick, cast out demons, control nature, forgive sins, accept people's worship, which Jesus did. He didn't stop people from worshiping when it happened, and raise himself from the dead. Only the Son of God could do that. And the Jews knew very clearly that if someone came and said, I'm the Son of God, they were equating themselves with God. So let's bring this all together. We believe Jesus was both fully 100% a human and at the same time fully 100% God. But there was a wonderful, beautiful reason behind God doing this. Us. We're the reason he did that. Theologian Michael Bird says it this way, The story of Jesus is the story of God becoming one of us and sharing in our humanity so that he might redeem humanity. The whole point of Jesus becoming uh, God becoming a man in Jesus Christ was to save us. We studied the doctrine of sin two weeks ago, and we saw just how vast our sinfulness is and how deep it runs through our existence. We can't escape from it. It's like this cancer we can't cure ourselves from. So we needed someone to do that. And if you read in Genesis 3, where sin is introduced into the world, and if you stopped at verse 14, you'd be convinced there was no hope for humanity. You'd be completely hopeless if you stopped at verse 14. But if you keep reading, starting verse 15 and going on to the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Joshua and Judges and on and on and on, the story starts to get a little more hopeful. Because what we see is that Jesus coming as God, becoming man, was never plan B. It was always plan A. God already had our hope planned out before Satan ever tried to tempt Eve to eat a piece of fruit. It was already planned. The Trinity knew before creation was made that it was far better for us to first experience the pain of sin and evil and separation so we could truly know and feel the bliss of forgiveness, love, and harmony with God. Just like a shadow proves the existence of sunshine, so evil proves the existence of love. And that love is not a concept that we say at Valentine's Day. It is a person. And that person was the God-man, Jesus Christ and he willingly came as a man so he could die our death so we could live. Luke 19.10 says, Jesus says uh, here in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That was his purpose, why he came. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full accept- acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world in the incarnation, took on human nature to save sinners. Guess who sinners are? All of us. God wanted, he desired to step into our existence, put on humanity, and experience all of our pain and suffering so that we could share his heavenly existence and be free of all pain and suffering forever. This is why we believe so strongly that Jesus was fully God and fully man. So why is it important for you to believe this? Four things. Believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man should humble us. It should humble us. I believe the incarnation is probably the greatest miracle the Bible shows. 
greater than any other miracle that we have. Because here we see these two natures, God and, and human, coming together perfectly without either one lessening the other. And that should humble us. Because the reason why Jesus did that, the reason why good th- God did that, was so that he could willingly lay down his life, not just for one person who didn't deserve it, but for the whole human race who doesn't deserve it. And this should humble us as we realize that we should have been on that cross instead of Jesus, the God-man. But he took our place. We'll study that next week in depth. Secondly, believing in Jesus is believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man should comfort us. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus to save you, then you can rest assured that his dying physically covered your sins and his resurrection gives you eternal life. You can rest assured. You don't have to worry about that anymore. One less thing to worry about. Keep worrying about COVID. Okay, keep worrying about that for right now, but you don't have to worry about your eternal destiny no more. Third, believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man should lead us to worship. It should lead us to our needs. We may not fully understand or comprehend how Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, but we can certainly understand how the miracle of the incarnation leads us to praise God for putting on flesh and rescuing us. If anything, give him praise for this. When he claimed being the Son of Man and being the Son of God, he was claiming his rights to be worshipped, obeyed, and submitted to. So he is worthy of our worship. And lastly, believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man should lead us to mission. It should lead us to action. You know, about 40 times in the gospel, Jesus references how God the Father sent him to seek and to save sinners, to put on humanity and accomplish the mission of salvation. And that same trinity that sent Jesus to fulfill God's mission to bring redemption, rescue, and restoration to a hopeless humanity, is the same trinity that sends each one of us to demonstrate and declare the message of redemption, rescue, and restoration to our hopeless friends, neighbors, and family members. Jesus is our model for being sent as missionaries. He came willingly, so we should go willingly. He came with humility, so we have these, we should have these conversations with humility. And he dwelt among us, just like we should be around and get into the messiness of people's lives get messy with them as we help them discover Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for leading us in worship as we have studied how you, God, became man. You were fully God and fully man at the same time, Jesus, and we can't comprehend it, but we believe it. So God, we ask right now that you help us to just rest in comfort, to be humbled, to fall on our knees and worship you for this and also be compelled to be living on your mission. Thank you for your word today and the truth that we have learned. We ask this in your powerful and precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We want to sing two songs now. See, son's going to lead us in, uh, see, son and Nicole is going to lead us in two songs. And uh, I would just encourage you during this first song, maybe stop and just kind of reflect and think a little bit about what we talked about today. Think about what God has shown you today from his word and think about what you need to do about it. Maybe you need to worship more. Maybe you need to be encouraged to to share this beautiful message more. Maybe you need some humility. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe you just need to be comforted because things aren't going as planned right now. So as we stand and sing together, I want you to just reflect and respond in the way that you would like.
to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, or oh, even in your suffering, you sought to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. this week with this truth 
Help us to live out this truth in our life. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. All right, you can have a quick seat. Uh, Paula, Giovanni, Laura, Maria, come up here for just a second. We have a special prayer time. Um, you guys will come on up, and I'll stand to the side. You stand. We'll, we'll, we'll keep some distancing to, to be safe. So, um, uh, so we have some really cool news that we're going to celebrate today and also just pray over. So for over two years now, uh, this family has been uh, working through adopting a child from Colombia, and it's been a bit of a, an emotional up and down for, for two years, a lot of paperwork, a lot of applications. The, the Gamba family went through the same thing, and um, so uh, good news is they have gotten a referral for a little girl in Colombia. She is three years old, and guess what her name is? Luciana. We're going to have two Lucianas in the church. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have two little Lucianas. And so for the next couple of weeks, they've got a few things, uh, some paperwork stuff they have to finish up. They've got to make travel plans, which is happening in a few weeks. So we want to celebrate with them today. We want to just pray for them. We want to pray. Uh, this has uh, been a, 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 a journey for them. And I remember talking with them years ago when Hope Church was you know, a newborn baby in a sense, and we, they were talking about their heart to adopt, and they want to do that, and all the ups and downs, and they've had so many conversations and tears shed, and now we get to celebrate with them. So that's what we're going to do today. So make sure you celebrate with them uh, this afternoon when we're done. But right now, I want all of us to pray for them. I'll pray for up here, but if you would just kind of silently in your seats there, just pray for them. And those of you on Zoom, if you'll just kind of do the same there in your home, uh, let's just pray for just uh, smooth and good for the rest of this journey. They're at the final stage. They have to travel and get back. And so let's just pray for all that. And then we look forward to meeting little Luciana in just a few weeks. So let's pray for them right now. God in heaven, we know that uh, adoption so beautifully and wonderfully shows us what you did for us. Because you, God, adopted us. You, we, were the, we were the orphans left spiritually without a home, and you took us in. You adopted us, and you call us your own sons and daughters. And so, God, whenever a family goes and uh, adopts another child, they are mirroring exactly what you did for us. It's just a beautiful picture of the gospel. So we want to praise you that you lead so many to adopt kids who just need a forever home. God, I want to praise you and join with Paul and Giovanni and Laura and Maria, this has been uh, quite a two, almost three-year process for them of applications, of uh, interviews, of waiting for an email, of uh, resubmitting files, all these things, dealing with government officials and waiting and waiting and waiting and at sometimes just losing hope and at other try times trying to revive that hope and all these back and forth with their emotions. But now, God, the day has come that we can celebrate with them. And so we join them as their church family to celebrate with them today. We praise you that you have worked this out in your perfect timing for them. So now, God, we want to pray for them for the rest of these, these next few weeks as they finalize the paperwork, as they make their plans to travel, they uh, arrange things with their jobs, and uh, they uh, have to uh, deal with quarantine and even the COVID measures. There's a lot of logistics, a lot of things they still have to do and plan for, but God, we just ask that you just make it super smooth and clear. Make it so easy for them to get down there, to get little, little Luciana and bring her back here to a forever home with them. So God, we ask that you just bless the rest of this journey. Make it such a joyful, wonderful time for them. And God, we look forward to in just a few weeks where we get to meet another beautiful little Luciana joining us here at Hope Church. So God, we thank you, we praise you. And at the same time, we just ask that you make the rest of this so smooth and good for them. Pray that you will use this to bring joy to their lives, bring gladness to their hearts, and unity to them as a family. So God, we praise you and we thank you. 
for how you have worked these things out. May it be a testimony. May it be an example for us to know that you still work miracles. We praise you for this miracle today. We ask this in your holy and precious, your powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for worship today. Those of you on Zoom, please feel free to stick around and say hi to one another. Say hi to uh, uh, the family up here and uh, just let them know that you're thinking of praying for them. And uh, for those of you in here, we just ask that you keep your mask on, uh, mingle safely as you can. Uh, but uh, we are officially dismissed. We will see you next week on Zoom. But in two Sundays, we'll be back here for Easter. Easter Sunday's in two weeks, and so it came quickly, all right? And so we'll be back here in person and Zoom here in a few weeks. So God bless, take care, and we'll see you next week.